Hello everybody and welcome to the third installment in this Christian education course which is being recorded and put up on YouTube, Somerset West United Church. Um, our topic today is Visio Divina as a spiritual practice. Visual, um, using visual means uh, to facilitate a conversation with God. My uh, conversation partner today is the Reverend Peter Langerman, who is Minister of Dunville Presbyterian Church, a long-standing friend of mine. Hello, Peter, and welcome to the show. Hello. Hi, George, thank you. I was just saying today is uh, one year since my transplant, um, so you must see my shirt I wore specially. Oh, wow. <laughs> One year, gee, where's the time yeah. gone? My goodness! Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic! Yeah. And Peter has just walked um, the Camino uh, from the Portuguese side. And how many days were you on foot there, you and Sally? Fifteen in total. Fifteen days. And how many kilometers? Uh, about two hundred and. Officially 260, but with the other bits and pieces, it's probably closer to 300. Wow, fantastic. Great. Okay, Peter, let me just do a little introduction yeah. to remind everybody who's been following this series what we've been talking about. We've been talking about spiritual practices uh, as opportunities to have a closer walk with God. And it's been three weeks now. The first week we looked at spiritual practices um, as, a, as a whole. And uh, we talked about why Protestants, people in the uh, non-Catholic and non-Orthodox churches, find spiritual practices so difficult. It's because we were word-orientated. And the great pendulum swing that happened in the Reformation in the 16th century was that we went back to the scriptures as our primary source for faith and life. And, uh, and uh, the scriptures are still our primary source, but more and more over the generations and over the years, there's been a reflection on the Reformation and the original uh, and ancient spiritual practices of the church, especially in the last century or so, where we've, um, uh, where we've got this rise of the spiritual and not religious, the people who really uh, are not interested in church in terms of its um, outer paraphernalia, pews and pulpit, but more interested in the core of the faith. And people have returned to those practices that were prevalent in the early church and also in the monastic orders, the monks and nuns, the, the rites of prayer, the hours, keeping the hours of prayer, um, uh, using the Bible in imaginative ways, like with Lectio Divina, using words, or Visio Divina, which we're talking about today, using images, um, and all of these things facilitating a closer walk with God. We're, we're influenced um, very much, well, I'm influenced by the book by Barbara Brown Taylor that you know so well, the An Altar in the World, where she basically looks at um, spiritual practices that anybody can do. You don't need a uniform. You don't, don't need special training. You don't need anything except yourself, a body in the world. And, um, and then she outlines some of those. So I want to hone in today on the spiritual practice of Visio Divina. Now, the definition I found of Visio Divina is this. Well, firstly, the word meaning sacred seeing. Sacred, the Visio being, being seeing and uh, Divina, sacred or divine. Um, an ancient form of Christian prayer in which we allow our hearts and imaginations to enter into a sacred image in silence to see what God might have to say to us. I like that. An ancient form of Christian prayer in which we allow our hearts and imaginations to enter into a sacred image in silence to see what God might have to say to us. What is your thoughts, Peter, and what are your experiences in this area of Visio Divina? Thanks, George. I think... Um... You know, you rightly say this, uh, the whole area of spiritual practices is something that um, we struggle with as Protestants, um, and particularly Reformed Protestants, I think. We, we assume our, our uh, expression of the faith is very word-based and sometimes quite cerebral. So these practices seem um, a little foreign um, and a little strange to us. Um, but as you say, these are these are ancient 
practices in the church. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, uh, there, there's, a, there's a long tradition of, of using, uh, the, the, you know, the senses um, to experience God um, <clears throat> and the imagination and, and all these other things that, that we tend not to think of as, as means in, in which to, uh, to connect with God. But, but these, are, these are very old. Um, you know, the icons, <clears throat> as, you, as we'll talk about later, uh, have, been, uh, have been in the church for many, many years. But, but predating those icons, there was Christian art, was uh, was a, a thing that that came about quite early on, you know. People um, depicted scenes from the life of Jesus, or they depicted uh, scenes from the Gospels, or they depicted, um, uh, you know, probably the one of the better known ones, uh, which was quite early, was the the use of the fish, the ichthus uh, symbol, uh, to identify the Christians, you know, in a time of persecution. So. So Christian art um, is 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 very ancient, um, and um, and uh, has been used for for centuries as a as a means for people to engage with God, um, and they've they've been, you know, against these practices there have been uh, pushbacks. You know, the, the great iconoclastic um, sort of uh, debates of the eighth century, which was strongly influenced by by the Muslims. Uh, the Muslim faith spreading, you know, particularly through Spain and, and through uh, parts of, of uh, the Mediterranean. Uh, you know, there was this idea that maybe this was a violation of the second of the second commandment. Um, and then, as you mentioned, the the, the great kind of classic um, move off, you know, in the in the time of the Reformation. Um, and I think that all of that has left us a little suspicious about the, you know, has left us as reformed Christians a little suspicious uh, about this. But uh, they, they, you know, the visual uh, engaging with God and 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 um, as a as a form of worship or prayer, using sight in this uh, instance, is something that's been with us for years. Well, um, the interesting thing to me is that uh, okay, the, these are pretty things. Um, mostly, although some of them are quite jarring. Um, so it's either a painting that we look at, and, uh, and this gives us access to God, or, we, or particularly religious art, um, icons, mostly out of the, um, the Orthodox tradition. Um, and, but it's not only the beauty. And I must tell you a little story before we go into this more deeply. Um, I remember years ago, in fact, it was 10 years ago, a decade ago, um, that I took a group, Sasha and I took a group uh, to Israel, and we did the, you know, the sort of pilgrimage that one does, um, flying into Tel Aviv and then going around um, uh, Caesarea Philippi, up to Cana of Galilee, across to the Sea of Galilee, staying a few days. But uh, all the way through, I was confronted with this, um, with this feeling um, and, and having to communicate it to the group, you know, um, we, we've landed in a modern country. We, we've not landed in the time of Jesus. We didn't time travel back 2,000 years. You know, there was no chariot waiting for us at the airport kind of thing. But the, 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 the most difficult of all, um, Peter, and I'm saying this because this is something that all of our people who are watching this will have to, to, to contend with if they want to use icons particularly, but also other religious art. When we got to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, we yes. had to say to each other, remember when you go through these doors, you are a guest. Because some of the mm -hmm. things that happen sure. inside that holy sepulchre and some of the visuals will be so jarring to you. You know, as a Protestant used to an empty church with no adornment, you know, the odd banner here yeah. and there and so on. It's, it's, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is a sensory overload. There are lamps, yes. you know, brass and copper lamps. There, there are icons everywhere you look. Um, there, a light is used in, you know, either areas are in, in deep shade and very sparsely lit, and others are quite bright and so on. And then there are stones, you know, on, on which Jesus, the body of Jesus is supposed to have been laid, and all these sensory things that we are not used to. So I think yeah. that when Protestants like you and I and the people who are watching this, um, 
when they think about icons, they will have to realize, we will have to realize that they come from a tradition different to our own, and we will have to do a bit of translation before we approach such a thing. Don't you think? Yes, I think so. Something I, I read recently, which was quite helpful um, with regard to icons, is that um, you know there are very there are very clear rules about the way in which icons are to be presented. Um, so I know at some point you're going to show an example of an icon, but icons are always presented in a in a two D uh, orientation. Now that's obvious because they're they're depicted on a on a canvas or something, uh, but but there is a it's purposely presented in 2d format and it is purposely um sometimes the um the proportions are actually out um and that is that is done on purpose uh, that's part of uh of the the way in which icons are, are constructed mm. um <clears throat> they are meant to be uh they're not meant to be a realistic depiction of, yes. of, of a saint or Jesus, but they are meant to be a kind of a window, um, you know, into the life of Jesus or into the life of, of a saint, um, and um, and often for us as, as Protestants as well, you know, the depiction of the saints is difficult. But but also, you know, in in iconography, when the if a saint is depicted, it's always with in the presence of Christ or with Christ working in that person's life. Um, so. Uh, you know, I think we don't always realize um, as Protestants how much, uh, you know, they, how much, how many rules there are and, and, and guidelines there are for those who, who, who put these together and, and how we experience them. Um, but then the other thing is, which somebody pointed out, which I was fascinated about, you know, to think about, um, was that when the, <laughs> when the reformers uh, reacted against Christian art. They were actually re reacting to to some of the sort of Renaissance depictions of Christian scenes, which you know were sometimes very um, scantily clad, uh, or these you know these um, these uh, you know angelic looking cherubs or, or something else. Um, the, the the reformers didn't have much access to to Eastern uh, iconography, you know, and. And, and East, you know, Eastern iconography, um, the, the characters are always depicted uh, in a, in, a, in a particular way. You know, they're they're, they're fully dressed, for instance. They're, you know, it's very it's it's very um, sedate uh, and, and and very well presented. So, really, the in a sense, the reformers were reacting against um, some of the excesses uh, that came out of the Renaissance, um, and some of the excesses. You know, as you said, we've just done this. Camino and and Portuguese and and Spanish Catholicism is is just as you said it's essentially overload. Um, you know you finish the the the, um, the Camino at the um, at the Cathedral of, of St James in Santiago, uh, and that cathedral is is an absolute. It is a sensory you know uh, explosion. Uh, you know the altar and behind the altar and the you know the the, the organ pipes uh, and the you know the, there is there a thing called the Borto Fumario. It's a it's a, an incense um, thing that holds incense. It's one and a half meters high. Um, it takes six men to to pull this thing. So they they put it there and they put the, the incense and the charcoal inside, and then six men pull on these big uh, ropes. Um, for it to swing up in the air, it swings across the front of the of the cathedral, you know, rising up to, you know, twenty one meters to the roof of the cathedral, um, yes. and there's this blowing, you know, the incense just billows from this thing. Yes. Um, and it's, it's marvelous to see, it's marvelous to see, but it's a, you know, as a as a sort of as a means to worship. That's something that we're not used to at all. Um, so. I think, I think, you know, what we need to 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 realize is that we have to be open to this. I think it, it's it's not something that everybody will will engage with, but um, <clears throat> but it is something we need to be open to. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about, excuse me, a practical example of this. Um, now, one of you know that one of my favorite authors is the um, writer Henry Nouwen, the Catholic priest and author. And um, he 
uh, used icons and he also um, very famously commented um, in a very deep way about the painting uh, of Rembrandt, The Return of the Prodigal Son. And uh, I was very interested um, about two years ago to discover this little piece uh, in a video a lecture that was given by Sue Mostello, who, who was the executor of his literary estate. Um, she tells about his method, um, and it's not to do with the prodigal son painting, but another one. Um, and and mm -hmm. I thought I would read this to you because I think that everybody who's listening may be interested in icons, but how do you actually use an icon or a painting, a piece of religious art, to get a closer? What are the practical ways? Well, listen to this. <clears throat> um, in a lecture given to the Collegeville Institute in 2012, Sue Mostella told a story about visiting an art gallery with Henry Nouwen in Ottawa, Canada. Upon entering the art gallery, Nouwen said that there was a painting he wanted to see. They found the painting and sat on a bench in the middle of the room opposite the painting. Nouwen was quiet and focused on the painting. It was by Van Gogh, hanging on the opposite wall. He gazed at the painting for a long time, maybe 15 or 20 minutes. Mostella was surprised and confused, thinking that he might want to discuss the painting. So she asked him, what are you doing? Explain it to me. What do you see? Nouwen looked at her and replied, are you in the picture? Mostella replied, no. Nouwen then said, step into the picture and walk around and you will begin to see. Uh, now, one of his, uh, you know, following from that, his method was basically to imagine himself in a picture um, mm -hmm. and, and to try on the characters, so to speak. And this generated for him a, um, you know, sort of closeness with God. Now, Michael Ford, his biographer, um, made a similar observation about Nouwen's method referring to the Eisenheim altarpiece in Col Colmar, France. There was a series of panels that were play, uh, painted for the victims of the plague between 1513 and 1515. By entering into the picture then, Henry received something of a mystical insight into the fulfillment of his vocation. He entered the mind not only of the painter, but also the patients who, have originally reflect, who were originally reflected on the panels and understood God was with them in their trials. So that was his, yeah. his method. Get yeah. inside the painting and walk around. Try on the characters. Yeah. Um, feel what it feels like to yeah. be. Yeah. So if we, if we yeah. then translate that to Nouwen's um, prodigal son, I'll put it on the screen there. Yeah. You can, yeah. you can see then how he wrote that book. Um, yeah. It gets into the painting. And the first uh, character he tries on is the younger son. Um, the one who's kneeling there, broken shoes, um, you know, uh, uh, undergarments which are torn and so on, shaven head. He gets into that person's character and he feels what it feels like to be a younger son. And, you know, he points out that um, he's not a younger son, but he did leave home. He went over to America, basically running away yes. from Dutch life and culture in which he did not really fit anymore and feels yes. what it feels like. And then he, then he, you know, tells Rembrandt's story, and he tell you first. So, so it's multi-layered. The prodigal son story is told, Henry's story is told, Rembrandt, and then uh, he encourages the reader to try on that role as well. And he moves then through the older son and the father, and so on. Um, is that something? Is that something that people could give a try? What do you think? <laughs> I think so. I, I think, um, you know, our tendency is, um, particularly as Westerners, um, I think is to, <laughs> is to approach these things very cerebrally, you know, in a, in a, you know, in, in, in sort of interpret. So let's interpret this, this picture. Um, uh, but what you're talking about is something quite different. It, it's actually entering into the picture to allow us to experience something uh, of God, um, of ourselves, um, in a new way, to explore 
new ways of understanding ourselves, new ways of, of understanding how God works with us. So I think um, I think it's well worth it's well worth doing, you know, as a as a spiritual exercise. Um, but it is something that that we sometimes take we'll take you know we'll take some getting used to. But I, I think the method you've described is is extremely helpful. You know, I think um, I often wondered. You know, when I read Noan's book um, on this painting, I often wondered, you know, because he, as you know, he sat before this painting for a very long time, every day for a certain length of time. And I often wondered how you could do something like that. But with that explanation, you can understand how something like that could work. So, yeah, I think it's something we could we could all learn from. Yes. So um, the the there is multiple layers here to this experience of Visio Divina. The multiple layers are um, get, if one gets inside a painting and imagines yourself as, as somebody in this painting, um, there's something to be gained. You know, what does it feel like to be a younger son? What does it feel like to, to, to be involved in the so-called wild living, squandering uh, gods? And in what ways have we done that? So it's a reflective process. But then uh, once you're finished with that, you move on to the other characters, you know, the older son. What does it feel like to be um, bitter, um, to feel like somebody else has been treated with more grace than you have, and you've had the, yes. you've drawn the short straw? And then finally, what yes. does it feel like to be a father? And really, that's, that's a, a mature a, a process of maturity, because now all of a sudden, you're not a receiver, but you are a giver, and you have responsibilities. Yes. And, and you and I have to comfort and, and welcome the lost children of God back home. And that's a massive yes. change, a transformation of how we, you know, relate to God. It's not that we take over God's role, but God then is able to use us uh, rather than constantly just be, you know, welcoming us home and forgiving us. We now move on yes. to, you know, to more important things. But I think the other thing that's so lovely is that we can also, um, when we're sitting in front of a painting like this, we can do some research and find out about the painter, you know, as Re as as now and did. What was Rembrandt's life yes. like? In what respect did he find himself in those characters? Um, and and yes, then yes. The, the the parable comes to life, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I think um, you know, you and I have used this this. This painting, of, you know, often when we've preached on the on that parable, um, because it 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 gives added dimension, I think, to yes. the um, to you know to that. Um, I wanted to to mention something, George. Uh, um, as I said to you before, the writer Wendell Berry um, yes. <clears throat> is somebody that I got to know through uh, Eugene Peterson's writing. And um, interestingly, I bought a. I, I was with Peter Blewett, who you and I both know quite well. Mm -hmm. Uh, in Edinburgh, and he took me to his favourite bookshop, which is a Catholic bookshop at the Church of St John in Edinburgh. And in the bookshop, I found a, a, a book by Wendell Berry called "The Peace of Wild Things." Yes. Um, and I, um, <clears throat> and um, then later on, much later on in our travels, we spent time with family of Sally's and um, her mom's um, cousin, actually. Um, and I, he told me about a somebody had given him a poem written by an, an, an American um, person. Um, <clears throat> and um, it was a, a person, an American Indian a person who had written this. And he had tried to make this, uh, share this with others in their, in their local church and been told, no, this is, this is pagan, it's not acceptable and so on. Oh so, um, <clears throat> Um, so I read to him this particular poem from from Wendell Berry's book, uh, and he was very moved. <laughs> and 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 that's and I left him the book as a, as a gift. But at the end, now this is a man who searched who, who for for um, fifty years by his own admission, if not longer, uh, has struggled to find a kind of way to express his own spirituality. He's a deeply caring, lovely man, but he doesn't he, he doesn't feel comfortable in the church and so on. Um, when I lent him this book, and he was he read the book while we were there, and um, and then he said, <laughs> "No, no, don't worry too much. Mrs. Worried too much about the theology of this. I just thought it was quite interesting." 
reading Wendell Berry's poetry, he said he's come to regard himself as a Christian pagan. Um, so, <laughs> but, uh, which I, I think what he, in- yeah, what he probably means is um, yes. from the pagan side would be somebody who appreciates the presence of God in nature, um, which is what the Celts what the Celts did so beautifully. The Celts uh, uh, were eyes open people looking for God in the thin places around them, and that is exactly. what so what was kind of squashed by the Catholics, um, you know, um, yes. yeah, in the Council of Whitby. It was just interesting for me that somebody who has struggled to find a way of of articulating, um, you know, his own approach to faith, managed to to connect with something, um, you know, that came out of Wendell, Wendell Berry's um, poetry. And I wondered if, uh, if I could read the poem to you, the one that I read to him, uh, the one mm-hmm. of... Uh, who, title of the book. So um, um, before you do that, can I just ask everybody who's listening, including myself, I think we should try to visualize the words that mm. you are speaking, because that's the beauty of Wendell Berry. He uses such beautiful images. So go ahead. Okay, so it's called The Peace of Wild Things. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world. And am free. Rest in the grace of the world and am free. Wow. Powerful. Powerful, powerful. Yeah. It's a it's a poem that always moves me when I read it, uh, you know, um, because it uh it just articulates. I think it's so I think so many of us can appreciate, you know, the, the experiencing God in nature in a way like this. Um mm. but again, oh. it's it's the Vigia Divina. You know, it's it's seeing God in, yes. in 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 the wild places, or the or, yes. or as the cult said, the thin of the, you know, yes. of the world. And you think about how much of your life you wasted by worrying, 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 worrying about stuff that never happened, or stuff that when it exactly. happened was, was actually not as serious as it, as your worry made it. Anyway, okay, Peter. Um, before we close up our session this morning. Mm-hmm. Um, I just want to talk about icons um, specifically. Um, we've spoken about, uh, yes. you know, paintings like Rembrandt's painting, Christian art. Oh, by the way, before we go off that, I just want to show um, those that are watching um, that, you know, the prodigal son's not the only one of these. I put one of the other Rembrandts on you. Let me see. There. That is the road to Emmaus um, that, mm. uh, that Rembrandt painted. You see Jesus in the middle there, and the two guests, uh, the two, you know, Cleopas and his friend. And it yes. would be possible to do just as much of a um, of a Visio Divina on this painting of Rembrandt as it is on the Prodigal Son one. I mean, we've got a biblical text behind yes. us to give us the basic story. Yeah. We can put ourselves into the oh. characters and so on. So anyway, there's that. But you did you mentioned this icon that I received now. This was given to me by James yes. Elias uh, 25 years yes. ago when I became a minister. It's called The Birth of yes. Christ by a Little Sister of Jesus. And it's one of those yes. Mary and Jesus and Joseph um, icons. Um, so my introduction to icons really came um, as a result yes. of reading the, uh, uh, the work or a thesis uh, by a mm. university friend of mine, Desiree Sneemann. Now, she um, wrote um, her, her um, thesis on, I think she used, if I remember correctly, she used Rublev's The Holy Trinity, um, yeah. but tried to explain what, what it meant, you know, to be um, sitting in front of a, an icon. Um, mm. And she said, she used this word gazing, 
Apparently, it's a yes. Byzantine. It's a uh, Orthodox um, tradition. You sit in front of an icon and gaze. Icons need to be gazed at with complete attention yes. and to be prayed yes. with. Gazing describes the yes. kind of contemplation one engages with with in respect of icons. It's an Eastern practice. And whereas Western Christianity concentrated on words, Eastern Christianity yes. often concentrated on images. Um, gazing. Uh, yeah, I mean, how, how, what is, how does one gaze? Any thoughts? I, I think, you know, um, having, as I said, just having come from this experience of, of um, Portuguese and particularly um, yes. Spanish Catholicism, uh you know there is n there is n you know you you almost are drawn into this this sort of gazing on things because it is just so it's be it is beautiful mm. but it, you know it's 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 evocative you know it draws you it draws you into um you know you wonder who these people are you wonder uh who this artist was you wonder at the at the kind of craftsmanship that went into it, and so on. Yes. This is a you know, um, uh, which is a very different experience to the way we sometimes experience art. You know, which is to walk around an art gallery and maybe we have somebody telling us in our ears, you know, what this painting is, and so on. But but this idea of of standing before something and and actually giving it our full attention um, is is a is a different way, I think for us to to engage with art and and of course with with a um with a with a spiritual connection you know um it, with the goal to 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 deepen our spirituality um you know the 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 icons particularly are were never meant to be um the focus in themselves they were always meant to be a a kind of a window, a kind of a thing that that draws you into something else. Mm -hmm. um, so as you as you gaze, as you contemplate, as you think about, as you pray through the icon, you are drawn into something else. Um, yeah. You know that's that's part of the you know that's as I understand it, that's part of the the the, the philosophy behind iconography is not to become uh, absolutely focused on the on the icon itself, but to but to come into the presence of God, yes. Um, and yeah, it sometimes takes a little time. Um, uh, but you know, you know, you mentioned Rublev's icon. Um, you know that painting of of um, Rembrandt of the Emmaus event uh, is evocative of that um, of that icon because the table in Rembrandt's picture is also open. Yes, you know, this is uh, you know, there's, there's a seat for others at that table. Yes. Uh, which is, I think, one of the things about Rublev's icon, you know, yes. is that the Father's Spirit are sitting together, in, experiencing hospitality and, and community and communion, but there is space at the table for us to join them. Mm. Um, and, and for me, that's, you know, that's that's what iconography is about. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's I can... Looking, looking at the... Mm. Yes. I can see a couple of problems. Um, number one... Uh, it might feel like wasting time um, because you're sitting and you're looking at something and there's no discernible outcomes. Um, so one has to get over this thing that we have that we're wasting time. We could be doing something else, we could be achieving something. And the second problem yes. I can see is that um, you can't only come with your cognitive skills. In fact, Henry Nouwen once said, using the phrase from uh, Theophan and the recluse, that you've got to come with the mind in the heart. You've got to come before God with yes. the mind in the heart. So you've got to feel as well as think. I mean, it's one thing to think yourself into a painting or an icon, but to feel is quite, you know, a different thing. So those are two two of the um, the challenges. But the third thing I want to say is something that I learned from Noun as well in his little book on um, icons. Um, he says something fascinating, and I wonder whether this is not maybe a key. He says that um, when he thinks about his mother, he thinks about a painting that was hanging in their house 
when he was growing up. Mm. Um, it was actually a Chagall painting, but it was bought by his parents before Chagall was very famous, so they didn't pay a lot for it. And in fact, they didn't actually value it in, in the sense that it was a, you know, a masterpiece, but they valued it because mm. they bought it, you know, as a celebration of their own relationship. So he mm. says he can't look at the painting of Chagall without remembering his mother. And he can't look at the, he can't think about his mother without remembering also the painting of Chagall. So I wonder whether there's not yeah. some something else that happens when one gazes upon icons. And, you know, I mean, would it be possible to get to the place where you can't think about God without having a picture in your mind and you can't look at that picture without also thinking about God? There's a memory aspect to this. Does it make any sense? I think it does. And I think, and we all know, you know, um, we all know events like this, you know, where we smell sounds um, that take us back to a particular time in our life. Um, you know, they bypass the sort of standard memory centers of the brain. But yeah. I want to say this, George, and I, you probably covered this in your introduction to spiritual practices, but spiritual practices, and this, this relates to the time-wasting aspect that you raised, spiritual practices are ways in which to cultivate behaviors in ourselves that we can't um, cultivate or advance by effort alone. Yes. So if I, if I want to be more loving or kinder uh, or, or, or whatever, you know, whatever fruit of the spirit or whatever thing I, I want to cultivate in my life, there's certain things I can do, but there's certain things that, are, that, uh, that I can't cultivate by effort alone, by trying harder actually is not um, working harder and putting more effort into it can't get me there so so that's where the spiritual practices come in the spiritual practices are never an end in themselves they are always aimed at developing in us christ likeness and i think if um you know if, if we saw the spiritual practices in that frame in that perspective that by yes. involving myself in the in, in hospitality, as you've covered already, or uh, Visio Divina, or, or, or whatever the practice is, that by involving myself in this, somehow, uh, in a way that we don't fully understand, somehow, deeper Christ-likeness is being, uh, is being um, uh, developed in me by the, by the Holy Spirit. Yes. That's a very important that, yeah, that for me it is very helpful around around this issue of 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 the spiritual practices. You know that that actually um, they 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 are not they are not ends in themselves, but they are they are means to a to a deeper a deeper Christ likeness and a deep experience of God, which which we call transformation. So something happens uh, in the process yeah. of the practice. Um, anything else, Peter, to talk about? I've got a last little piece which I want to read from Barbara Brown Taylor's book on prayer. But is there anything else that um, yes. can perhaps be helpful to uh, any of the folk who are watching this and who are wanting to try Visio Divina, uh, perhaps for the very first time? Yeah, I, you know, I think, um, you know, maybe sometimes this is easier sometimes, you know, sometimes it's easier to do in a, in a small group, you know, than to do on your own. Um, so maybe in a, in a small group setting, uh, you know, on, on one occasion is to maybe get Rublev's icon. Uh, I think it's beautiful, but, you know, you can use anything really. Uh, and just ask people to to spend, you know, a little bit of time looking at, gazing at the icon, using your phrase, uh, and then what they experience, you know, um, and, and you know, what what they meant to them, or what, you know, what they learned from that uh or, or now it's painting or, or or anything, but actually to do this as part of a as part of a, a small group or a uh, you know a group of two or three friends, um, you know that that might be a way. But sometimes when we do this on our own, um, <clears throat> we uh, we think, well, you know, I've seen all that there is. But when we do it with two or three people, somebody says, well, I see this. Somebody says this. A bit like we do with with, um, you know, word dwelling exercises. We read a passage and then we have different insights. Maybe this would be a, a way to do it with a with an icon or, or a picture, to do it with a, with a few people. Yeah, you could do it in a group. There's nothing 
it's nothing that says that you have to do it, you know, on your own. As long as you yourself are focused on the on the painting or the picture. Yes. So, a uh, Bob Brown Taylor um, is uh, one of the people I so enjoy reading when it comes to spiritual practices because she's a real person, and you know, it's not like she's holier than thou. She she battles with the same things you and I battle with. So, I thought I would read this last little piece from her chapter on prayer, being present to God, which is in her book, An Altar mm -hmm. in the World, A Geography of mm -hmm. Faith. Um, she writes this. Since I'm a failure at prayer, I keep an altar in my room. It is really an old vanity made of rosewood with fancy scrollwork around an oval mirror and a small stack of drawers on either side. At worst, I think of it as a piece of furniture that I offer God as a substitute for my prayers. At best, I think of it as a portal that stays open whether I go through it or not. I keep some icons on it and a lot of candles. When people ask me to pray for them, I write their names on slips of paper and put them in a small brass box that sits in front of two paintings, one of Jesus and one of his mother. Although Mary is looking lovingly in her son's direction, she occupies her own space, which I like. Mary is more like me than her son is, after all. Both of her parents were human. She was born and she died in the usual ways. What was unusual about her was her reliability. No matter what life pitched at her, Mary did not duck. She endured a different pregnancy to bear a singular child, whom she loved reliably through all the years of his con conventional controversial life. When her son was cut down, she was there. When it came to prepare his body, she was there. When he was not in his tomb, she was there. As much as I had to presume on her reliability, I know she will remember the people whose names I've placed in the brass box, even when I forget. Mm. Most nights, mm. the altar just sits there, holding all of these pictures and wicks and names, then comes a night when I'm in deep need, deep fear, deep thanks, or deep want, either for myself mm. or for someone I love. And I light a candle on the altar. Some are tall and thin, others are short and squat. Some smell like vanilla and others like sardic balsam. Some were gifts. Mm. I bought my others for myself. Lighting them all generally mm. requires at least 10 kitchen matches. And even when I burn myself getting to the last of them, when I'm through, I sit back on my heels and try to take it all in. The mirror behind the candles doubles their glow. The icons catch mm. the light, pitching in back and forth. I can see my reflection through the flames, though only dimly since the mirror is an old one and has lost much of its shine. Prayer overtakes me there. I am mm -hmm. utterly swamped sure. by the presence of the holy. I would bend my head to the ground if I could take my eyes off the beauty. As it is, I do not even know for sure if I am breathing. The altar is giving me more life than I know how to ask for. I can no longer tell the difference between need, fear, thanks and want. In this light, I see how they are all facets of some sparkler. I see how they are all faces of the same love. This answer to my prayer is so far beyond my doing that I cannot find the words to forswear my own input. All I did was light the candles. Did God find me or did I find God? Hush, the time for words is past. Beautiful. I think, yeah, you know, I really think that is a beautiful description of the power of an image um, yeah. whether it be a painting or an icon, to connect us with uh, the unspeakable mystery um, that we call God. And I really, you know, encourage everybody who's watching this piece to give it a go. You know, find a book, uh, or yeah. don't bother with a book, start with the internet, Google it. Um, find somebody who's written about the power of icons, the how-tos, and, uh, and find a picture. You don't have to buy one, you can Print one off the uh, the internet. All Rembrandt's beautiful paintings are there, but also other wonderful religious art and iconography, and they can become vehicles for a closer walk with God. Absolutely.
Thank you for your time, Peter. It's been lovely to have a conversation. Enjoyed it very much. Yeah. Thanks for the invitation. Take care. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>